The last note is that there's a patch of construction one kilometer after checkpoint six. Follow the instructions of the road workers. If you need to drop out, send me a text. It's on your control card. Ride safe, randoners, shouted Jan, the organizer. As Jan stepped off the start line, a group of 15 eager riders shot up the road. The draft, he thought. His power climbed, his heart raced, and his speed increased. The first drops of sweat began to form on his brow as the distance to the peloton finally stopped growing. The windbreaker, a few minutes ago, barely enough to keep the chill at bay, now an oven. I'm gaining on them, he thought, ignoring the burning sensation building in his quads. Suddenly, the gap shrank and disappeared. A red light. Elation gave way to embarrassment as a group of seven casually rolled into the line moments later. You are really giving it the beans, exclaimed the lead rider. Another five riders arrived before the light changed to green. Three kilometers down, 297 to go. Our protagonist has a lot to learn about pacing a brevet. Let's make this story have a happy ending. The beginning of a long ride is critical in setting up future success. Everyone is at peak freshness and nervous with anticipation. The danger is in short-sightedness. There will always be a crew of highly motivated riders that blast off from the start line. Most likely, they'll be found in about an hour, resting at a cafe. Riding a brevet like a Sunday club ride is not a recipe for success. Research into various ultra-distance sports shows high-level athletes use a gentle, positive split, where there is a slow decrease in performance over time that often levels out. Top-tier athletes limit changes in performance over time due to their experience, discipline, and by virtue of just being more fit. It is inevitable that the first period of an ultra-distance event will be slightly quicker than the rest. Various kinds of energy deficiency, stomach issues, sleep deprivation, and the ups and downs of a long effort will reduce performance as time goes on. However, controlling the difference between these paces is linked to overall better performance. For example, the pacing of the record holder for the women's quintuple day and deca day triathlons was analyzed and found to have a mostly even pacing strategy except the first half of day one. By contrast, research shows amateur athletes consistently go out too hard and end up with strong positive splits. A fast pace in the beginning quickly falls off and performance continues to decline over time. There also seems to be agreement that amateur athletes have lower aerobic capacity, lower fatigue resistance, and lower activity economy than the elite athletes. This compounds their poor pacing strategies to result in even worse performance. A result of these factors is that amateur athletes just need more time resting and they have more significant speed reductions to get rest than the higher performing athletes. This is the pacing strategy where many randonneurs find themselves. As amateur athletes, randonneurs need to combat both our tendency to go too hard early on and the inevitable decrease in performance potential over time. We can do this by assessing and respecting our BTP, Brevet Threshold Power. BTP is a term I use to describe the maximum sustainable power in a somewhat steady state effort over a target brevet distance. At the macro level, targeting your BTP from the beginning of a brevet is the endurance cyclist's best route to a nearly even split pacing strategy. Alongside efficiency, benefits include delaying the onset of various fatiguing factors, promoting sustainable fueling, and reduced rest and recovery requirements. A more enjoyable experience is also a likely outcome. Pacing at your BTP might feel too easy when you start, but you'll thank yourself later on. To estimate your BTP, a power meter and real-world experimentation are needed. Start by targeting what you suspect to be a sustainable power for rides approaching brevet distances with typical terrain for brevets in your area. Using historical data is helpful if it's available. Pace climbs modestly and fuel properly. Note your feelings and perceived effort, especially towards the end. Adjust your target efforts up or down for future long rides based on your recorded feelings to hone in on your ideal BTP. Your base BTP may need to be dropped downwards as distances increase above 300 kilometers. 
since sleep loss and other fatiguing factors become more prominent. Lacking a power meter, a heart rate monitor can serve as a flawed proxy. Neumeier found that 70% of max heart rate was roughly the ultra-distance threshold for 24-hour rides. Individual variation and physiological and environmental changes over time can have a significant impact on heart rate. While following your BTP on a macro level will lead to energy and time efficiency, adjustments to effort according to specific riding conditions must also be considered. Research suggests a variable pacing strategy regarding riding conditions will lead to the most efficient completion of a course. Dozens of factors like climbs, group dynamics, fueling, urban riding, weather, wind, and more require deviations from BTP for an ideal pacing strategy. But in what conditions is it best to push a bit harder? And when is it best to recover a bit? First, consider urban riding encountered on a brevet. Frequent intersections, traffic lights, obstacles, and poor road conditions heighten a rider's awareness. It flares their road rage and often pushes them to subconsciously ride hard. Unfortunately, urban riding is the worst place to push hard. Speeds are often capped by conditions, and frequent stops and starts kill momentum. Energy is just much better used to maintain speed than it is to accelerate. In these areas, accelerate slowly and keep a relaxed pace. Hopefully, this also helps reduce frustration. Just accept that time will be lost when going through towns, but that it doesn't mean energy needs to be wasted as well. Next, consider various stops taken on a brevet. The least efficient speed is zero kilometers per hour. Abiding by your BTP helps reduce the need for rest and recovery, but breaks are great and often necessary. Prioritize time for what is required and what is highly rewarding. For example, plan the early convenience store snack stop so that you just run in and out in a few minutes. You'll save time for the famous restaurant 150 kilometers into the ride where you'll be wanting an extended break anyway. Set up specific points in a ride or specific times of day to care for hygiene, reapply creams, and do basic bike maintenance. Sleep is another major consideration for pacing, but wholly beyond the scope of this video. Sleep and break strategies will be covered in future videos, so make sure to subscribe to the channel so you won't miss out. For general road riding, the effects of different efforts can be calculated on climbs, descents, and in various wind conditions. The Gribble.org calculator is again the tool of choice. For these calculations, we don't care about extra speed or extra distance covered. Our concern is time saved. Using my estimated variables, a BTP of 150 watts, and a 10 minute 50 watt boost as our dependent variable, with some middle school math, we can see interesting outcomes. Climbing, especially steep climbing, is far and away the best condition to add extra effort, with over two minutes gained for each 10 minutes of extra power. Strong headwinds prove to be the next best condition to add effort, albeit a distant second to climbing and only slightly better than flat, windless riding. Conversely, we can also determine good times to rest or a soft pedal. Powering down descents prove to be a waste of energy, so they're an ideal time to rest. The excitement of cruising at 40 kilometers an hour with the aid of a tailwind may entice extra effort too, but ease up slightly instead as this work saves little extra time. These guidelines were calculated for riding solo, but randonneuring is often a social event. Others may be willing to share the burden of cutting the wind. When drafting on a windless flat, expect to save 25 to 40 watts at randonneuring speeds. 40 watts sounds great, but you'll also need to return the favor. And a chain gang can last for a very long time. With that in mind, the lead rider should not go too far above their brevet pace, especially in groups of two or three where time at the front can be pretty high. If more riders can share pacing duties, more rest time and a greater draft benefit can be enjoyed by the drafters. This means a greater pace can be sustained by the rider on the front too. Research into riding when weather conditions could result in mild hypothermia or overheating proved to be wide in scope and will each require their own episode. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss them. These conditions have potential to spiral out of control into medical emergencies as they degrade the body's thermoregulatory responses over a long athletic activity. In short, it seems that moderating the pace slightly when overheating and when getting cold is a suitable pacing strategy 
albeit for different reasons. Pacing strategies used in these conditions should be done in tandem with trying to manage the body temperature in other ways too. A slower cycling pace will reduce factors that make it cold, like sweat, caloric deficit, dehydration, physical exhaustion, and inactivity breaks while you're damp with sweat. Actively and liberally managing layered, zippered clothing can help you stay comfortable and warm and also as dry as possible. Proper fueling and hydration and getting quality sleep will help maintain your thermoregulatory response when getting cold. A long rest indoors to get warm, get fed, dry off a little bit, and maybe even take a nap seems like it may put lots of pressure on your pace. But by overbiking and pacing the rest of your ride well, you can afford this safety net. A slower cycling pace also creates less internal heat in hot riding conditions. This reduces excessive sweating and dehydration risk. Drinking plenty of cold liquids, ice bottles in jersey pockets, pouring water on yourself, consuming electrolytes, and fueling with sources easy on your stomach go a long way to maintaining a consistent pace when it's hot out. Of course, breaks in air-conditioned places or in shade can also help manage heat. Again, by overbiking and pacing the rest of your ride to the conditions, you can afford the time to cool down for your safety and enjoyment. So we've determined that a typical amateur paces poorly with a strong initial surge and deteriorating performance over time. We've also found that a mostly even pacing strategy can be had by using brevet threshold power as a pacing metric. Extra effort is best used on climbs and to some extent in headwinds. While it's better to rest or soft pedal when it's hot, when it's cold, in urban riding conditions, on descents, and again, to some extent with tailwinds. Now, off bike time also needs to be managed wisely. With all those things put together, let's see how our protagonist does on his 300K brevet. It's been great riding with you, bud, nodded Carl with a tired smile. I thought when you joined us, we could just ride your draft the whole way. Good thing you settled in and didn't try to rip our legs off on the climbs. Thanks. I thoroughly enjoyed the ride. I'll send you the pictures I got of the group crossing that big bridge before we grabbed fast food. Never thought about putting a wrapped burger in my jersey pocket, he replied. That saved a good chunk of time for that cat nap under the gazebo at the park. Still finish in under 17 hours, too, said Carl. The 400k is in two weeks. Wanna join? Most of us will be there. Just don't give it the beans so hard at the start. No stoplights to catch you for miles on that course.